In sacred times of word, wonder, and awe, in ordinary days of work and play. Whether we are stuck in doubt's mud or standing in faith's shoreline.
guess what? We kind of play follow the leader every day in our life. School, sports, church, how about bread? And almost every activity that we do, we have leaders and we're there to guide us, right? Our teachers, our principals, our sports coaches, our teachers at church. Um, every day we have to choose what leaders to follow. I gotta stand up, I'm not a <laughs> I teeter talking too much. Ms. Lee is going to be talking with the congregation today about a leader, but I want to tell you about another leader, and his name is Jesus. When Jesus came, Jesus came and he gathered some disciples, and they started following him. And they started doing things that he was doing, like loving, and caring for people, and healing people who were sick being with people when they were sick. And Jesus started teaching some very hard teachings. Things like love your enemies. Or turn the other cheek. And some people heard that. You know what they said? That's hard. I don't know that we can do that. And some of the people decided not to follow him. And so Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, how about all of you? Will you still follow me? You know what they said? What do you think they said? They said yes. And um, Peter said, Lord, we know that you are the Holy One of God. And so they decided to stay and they decided to follow you. They were not going to turn back from that. Which reminds me of a song. How many of you know the song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus? Do you know that song? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach it to you, all right? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Everybody join with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. You know, following Jesus, it's not always easy. Sometimes Jesus asks us to do hard stuff like love our enemies or love those who may not love us back or to treat people with kindness even when they don't treat us with kindness. But you know what? God wants us to try and God wants us to follow because God knows it's the best way for us to go. Alright, so let's pray together. Everybody would be happy. Dear God, you have called us to follow. May we answer yes. I'll follow you. No turning back. Amen. Thanks, guys.
So earlier this week, you know, I guess it was early Wednesday morning, I went into Jane's office and, and said, so what are, you, what are you doing for your sermon this week? Um, I want to know where you're going so that I can write my minute for mission. And he's like, well, I'm not really sure yet what I'm going to say or where it's going to go. So we talked about it for a few minutes. And after about 10 minutes of me saying, oh, well, you know, you can say this. Well, you should say this. Oh, you definitely should say this. He finally looked at me and said, well, Leah, how about you preach this? <laughs> so here I am. But the trade-off on Wednesday was that he had to go to the so, I know he had a good time with that as well. So, our scripture reading today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 10 through 14, and 21 through 29. Hear the word of God. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone so that we can serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them. All of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal death. death. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground in the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, the year was 1996, and my friends and I decided that we were going to play a game of Capture the Flag. But this wasn't just any game of Capture the Flag. We decided that we were going to play at night. All night long, in fact. Um, but you have to remember that I grew up in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina, so that also meant that we were going to be playing in the woods. So evening came, and we all gathered at the edge of the woods, and we divided up into teams and got our flashlights ready for a long night. The red team went in one direction, and the blue team went in the other direction. We walked a pretty good ways, 
into the woods with our flashlights before we found the perfect place to hide our flag. We chose one person to guard the flag and another person to be the jailer. And the rest of us were supposed to take off into the woods in search for the other team's flag. The whole point was to capture the other team's flag and get back before getting caught by the other team. And now, we had some advantages playing in the woods. We could hide behind tree trunks and bushes and, and branches. But playing at night was actually a little harder than I thought. I quickly realized that having my flashlight turned on was a dead giveaway for my location. So I turned my flashlight off, and the only thing I had to guide my way through the, moon, through the woods was the moonlight. Now I'm not going to lie. There was a moment there when I thought that I was really lost. I didn't hear any voices. I didn't see any other flashlights. And there was no telling where I was. I sat down in the leaves next to a tree trunk and wondered, maybe I should go back. Maybe this isn't the really safest thing to do. Or maybe I should just turn on my flashlight. Someone could find me. You know, if I got caught, at least I would know that I was safe. And I wasn't going to be alone anymore. And I wasn't going to be lost in the woods. You know, when I was reading the scripture for today, I couldn't help thinking of this experience of being lost in the woods at night and being chased by the other team. But let's be honest, the Israelites weren't playing a friendly game of catching the flag. Their lives were at stake. Their freedom was at stake. And it probably would have been easier for them to go back to Egypt, to go back into oppression, the oppression that they knew, rather than what they didn't know in the wilderness. But they were trapped. They were cornered between an army of Egyptians and the Red Sea. There was no place to go. There was no way out. And the only choices left that lie in front of them were surrender to a life of slavery or death in the wilderness. And so they cry out to God. And then they immediately start complaining to Moses, saying to him, what have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? We do that, don't we? We do that all the time. We ask our leaders to guide us to a new and hopeful future, and then we complain when the road gets rough. But Moses was a great leader because he knew that this wasn't about him delivering the people. He knew that this was a story about what God was about to do. And in this moment, Moses tells the people to do three things. He says, don't be afraid. Stand firm and be still and see the deliverance. So many times throughout scripture, we hear the words, do not be afraid. We just heard those words this past Christmas when they were spoken to Mary and Joseph and the shepherds in the fields. And then they're told to stand firm and be still. You know, when you're trapped between an army and an ocean, when panic sets in, being still seems like the opposite of what's safe. Most people would say, run! But Moses knows that standing firm and being still is not an act of passivity. Because it's in calming our fears and finding stillness in our minds that we can begin to open our eyes and see God's deliverance that's right in front of us. 
You know, let's be honest. It's hard to see God's deliverance. You know, we turn on the news and there's two wars being fought around the world. There's growing tensions among the countries and even growing tensions here at home. Lines are being drawn between ideologies and people. And the, here's the ironic thing, is that every side, every side says they're fighting for freedom. Or are we? Do we even know what freedom is anymore? You know, the Israelites were so long in slavery, they had no idea what freedom was like on the other side of the Red Sea. They couldn't even imagine it. Well, they, they dreamed of it, but they didn't really know what freedom was like. We, on the other hand, we have lived so comfortably in the land of the free for so many years that maybe we've taken for granted the freedom that we have. Some of us, including myself, have no idea what it's like to be a slave or to live in slavery. And without this understanding, without hearing the stories, can we even appreciate the gift of freedom? Do we even know what freedom is anymore? I want to be very clear. Freedom does not mean that I get to do whatever I want, harm whoever I please without consequence. That is the very definition of oppression. And in our fear and our rushing and our trembling, we can't even tell the difference between slavery and freedom. We can't see God or the deliverance that God offers right in front of us. See, Moses knew in that moment they were at a crossroads between slavery in Egypt or freedom on the other side of the Red Sea. And there was only one who could deliver the people. Only one who could make a way out of no way. Only one with the power to perform miracles amidst the turmoil of fear and slavery. So Moses says, don't be afraid. Stand firm and be still and see the, de the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish. But following God down the road of deliverance is also not easy, is it? Following God through a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on another and an army that's closing in behind us. It's frightening. And amid the rubble and turmoil of wars, political divisions, oppression, and slavery, it can sometimes feel impossible to walk that road. How can I possibly see God, or much less, find deliverance in the midst of all this pain? Too often, we want to choose sides. And like the Israelites, we want to think this story is about the Egyptians versus the Israelites. But Moses reminds us that this story is not about us versus them. This story is about God against all the forces that keep us enslaved. Sometimes the forces keeping us enslaved are pharaohs and kings. And sometimes the forces that keep us enslaved are buried down deep within the recesses of our anger and our fear and trembling. 
following God is not easy. And the way that to deliverance that God opened for the Israelites didn't require that they sit still, but be still and stand firm. Because God is making a way. God is opening a pathway for us to walk. So many times through Exodus, God is referred to as this, this pillar of fire and cloud. Or, or God is in a pillar of fire and cloud. Have you ever noticed that? We see it in the burning bush story. And we see it when the Israelites look up to the top of Mount Sinai. They always refer to God as this pillar of cloud and fire. Can you imagine what that looks like? I've, I've sometimes imagined it as like a ball of smoke. Maybe God's a ball of smoke. Or maybe God is like a fire around the bush, the burning bush. Or maybe it's like a cloud with flickering lights inside. Can you imagine this picture of God? Very different than the pictures we have of God now. And sometimes we read these old texts and we imagine that God is somehow vengeful or scary. But I guess I don't see it that way. I think this image reminds me that God is just shrouded in mystery. There's this cloud of mystery that's surrounding God. You know, we'll never really truly know the ways of God, will we? Nor can we predict them. Moses couldn't even predict what God was about to do. And like Moses, we will never really know what the path ahead will look like. We can only do as Moses had instructed, to be still and see the deliverance And follow God, the God who is making a way. The year was 1996, and I sat down in the leaves, and I wondered if maybe I should go back. Maybe I should just turn on my flashlight and run back. If I got caught, well, at least I know I was, I was safe and I wasn't going to be alone and lost in the woods. And then I heard it. There was some rustling in the leaves and I heard some talking. Someone had been caught and they were leading me right to the base camp. All I had to do was watch and wait for the right time. You know, those were fun times as youth. But the stakes seem a lot more real now. We're at a crossroads. And now we're faced with a choice. Each of us is faced with a choice. Do we turn back to slavery? Or do we follow God to freedom? I can't tell you what the path ahead is going to be or what it's going to look like. God's ways, as you know, are shrouded in mystery. But I do know that God is the great miracle worker who makes a way when it seems like there is no way. So may we follow the words of Moses, who reminds us to be still and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. And even when the journey feels rough, with waters of water on your right and left, and an army closing in behind you, May you walk on dry ground, knowing that the great deliverer, the great miracle worker, is delivering you. Let us pray.
God of all hope and salvation. We come to you sometimes with heavy hearts, burdened by the news of continued wars, oppression, and destruction. We admit, God, that the burden sometimes feels, feels too much to carry. It's too overwhelming to take in. And we, like the Israelites, feel tempted to turn a blind eye, to walk away, or to follow the path that leads us back to slavery. God, calm our spirits. Rest our fears at your feet so that we may see your ways to deliverance. But God, we also ask that you give us the courage to stand firm in our faith as we continue to work towards peace and wholeness. Help us as we continue our work within the community and within the world. That we may walk the road toward peace and freedom. As we navigate the uncertain road ahead, be with us and guide us to safe passage. And may we pray as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in singing our hymn of communion, page 399. We'll sing all verses of O God Unseen Yet Ever Near. Let us sing together. we remember here today at this table grew from the Passover. And we read the story of Exodus of how preparations were made quickly that night with the Israelites ready to leave Egypt as soon as the Passover had ended. I think there's something to be learned from that first Passover where the leaders of Israel were instructed to come to the table but also come to the table ready for action. Today, when we gather around this table, we celebrate something very different from the moments of that first Passover meal. 
Today we come to this table with celebration and hope, not fear and trembling. Even so, how would our world change if we also came ready for action? How would our world be different if we came ready to be nourished by this meal in order to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ? who first offered us this meal, the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. I invite us to ponder those questions. We come now remembering that night where Jesus first gathered with his disciples and he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, broken and given for you. Take remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we pause at this table to ask you to forgive us of our sins, to give us the strength and the courage to go on, to face whatever we need to face in this world, and knowing that we can do it with you as our guide. Help us to be calm and quiet and to listen to what you have to say. Let it all begin with this communion table. Amen. In like manner, he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, remembrance of me. Let's pray. After the wise men have gone back to their homelands, after the shepherds have gone back to tending their sheep, after the angels' songs are but a whisper, And after Mary and Joseph have taken Jesus back to Nazareth, and after we have taken down and put away our Christmas decorations for another year, the realness of Christmas begins. Let us become your eyes, ears, mouth, hands, and feet as we gather at this table and share this cup may we realize the fullness of your beauty. May we gather strength and courage and may to be the servants that you would have us be in your world. Amen. Here at FCC, all are invited to come and and join us for communion this morning. We serve it two ways here. First, you can remain seated in your pews, and our deacons will come, and they will serve you, and you can serve one another seated right where you are in the pews. Or perhaps you want to come forward this morning, a way of coming forward to Christ and to the table. Our elders will be stationed out front, and you can come and take that way this morning. I only ask that you let them get in place before you start coming forward. But whichever way is more meaningful to you, whichever way you would prefer, know that you are wanted and welcome at this table. We come now not only to commune with one another, Jesus Christ our Lord, and our Savior. The table is open. The meal is ready. Let us come and partake. Just as I But that thy blood was shed for me, and that <coughs> thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come.
Just as I am, the wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. The groceries or they get it crumbled up at the bottom of a purse or thrown into the trash. But I want to tell you a story this morning of one lady that was not one of those people. Her name was Dina Howard. And she began collecting and receiving and keeping her receipts after going shopping one day and seeing at the bottom of her receipt that she could earn a little extra money for a nonprofit organization of her choice by collecting and turning the receipts in. And she was involved in a mentorship program called Kids in Kinship, where she'd been matched with a 14-year-old girl, a mentee. And so she started telling her friends and her family and her neighbors all about the program, and, and she and they started keeping receipts, and it took some time. But she and they and others were able to raise $150,000 for the program just by holding on to and turning in receipts that otherwise might have been thrown into the trash after another trip to the grocery store. There are programs like this all over. In fact, our church is involved in just such a program. We've been collecting for some time now banks' receipts that help our preschool to earn back a percentage of the total spent. And we also help support them by updating our, our Kroger Rewards card. If you have a Kroger Rewards card, you can update that just by simply selecting FCC Preschool from the list, and then money spent with that rewards card will help go back to our preschool. And all of these little ways may not seem like much, a percentage here, a percentage there, but it does and it can make a difference. In your bulletin this morning, you'll see a little insert, some more information about the ministry that we offer. It not only helps our preschool, but it can make a difference to our community moms and dads who entrust their kids to our school every day. So I encourage you when you are out and about and you're shopping to remember those receipts and that a little can go a long way when we let God God prepares for us and our needs. In the story of Exodus, even in the midst of conflict and strife, God was calling them toward a positive and hopeful future. That story is still true today for us. We are invited to give to the work of God in the church because we believe God is still preparing and calling us toward a positive future. We will now receive the gifts which will help us as a church join God's positive future plans. Let us come with our gifts eyes and offer.
still remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, page 517, verses 1, 2, and 4 of Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. And as we stand and sing today, those wishing to make that confession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or, or perhaps you're looking for a church home, a place to come and pursue your own journey of faith, we would love to have you as part of our family here at FCC if that's your decision today. As we stand now and sing together, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling, verses 1, 2, and 4. always a pleasure to watch your spouse grow in their own faith journey, so I'm excited about that. Uh, after our service, we're going to have our congregational meeting. Let's take a five-minute break. Everybody can go stretch, and then we'll come back in here for our congregational meeting, but let's bow our heads now for the benediction. And now as we leave this place, go with the God who can part the troubled waters of your life and lead you through to dry ground. Go with the God who can scatter and subdue all that hinders you on your journey. Go forth in God's grace and in God's peace. And together.